Okay, everyone. Uh, we're about to go live, I think. So, welcome to our final um, for this year. And maybe let me just make sure that I'm not uh, going to interrupt myself. I am. Okay, good. Sorry, I needed to mute the other screen. So, um, big night tonight. This is the December 1921s. Of course, it's where you know they get into the the nitty gritty and the final arguments with the British uh, delegation in London. And then of course the Irish delegation come home and have to wrangle uh, the cabinet and the doll and kind of justify their decisions. So there's a lot to get through tonight and I have a lot of slides, uh, which I'm hoping will match up with each other. So I'm just going to try to take you through it almost chronologically if we can. And, you know, I probably have written a little bit too much and there's a lot of content on the slides too, because I've taken a lot of chunks of their different um, speeches. So you can see these are all available online. I think I've quoted them, um, but basically, you know, the Irish government have them. I, I can put up sources later on. So uh, December 1st, after seven weeks uh, since October of negotiation, the British presented the Irish side with a draft treaty. Now, it's important to going in to kind of remember that at no point in October, November, realistically, did the Irish ever come with their own document. So they were sort of always working off of working documents provided by the British. Uh, you know, that you could argue was a kind of a, a point of contention later on. This... Uh, draft offered dominion status it did include an oath of allegiance and of course the boundary commission would be set up to deal with the issue of ulster and i've said if you watched in october november ulster was an interesting one because it was actually kind of kicked the can was kind of kicked down the road really you know the the offer was there that um you know they would try to get ulster to come in with a dublin parliament uh, but basically you know what they eventually settled on was that the boundary commission would be set up and you know wink wink between ourselves northern ireland would be such a small state would be rendered such a small state it would be economically unviable and they'd have no choice but to come in and it looks like everyone sort of accepted that on the face of it um so the they go home to ireland they have a cabinet meeting on december 3rd fractious meeting they agree four to three to accept those draft terms. Uh, William Cosgrave casts the decisive factor or votes are in favour of the treaty. De Valera secured a pledge from Martha Griffith, however, that they would not sign until it was referred back to the cabinet. Now, I don't really understand what was the point of that. I have to say, you know, like the cabinet had voted four three. There's not really going to be any changes. Obviously, they're asking for some changes and for some, you know, kind of clarification, maybe on, on the oath, at which they do get actually some concessions. Um, but I mean, it was not going to be huge differences between, you know, here, uh, be, between what they were offered on the third. So um, on the fifth, Lloyd George met Collins and actually I will go back to that cartoon Um so, you know, very cantankerous. You can see these are the, I'll just put that up there while I'm uh, talking. Let me try and move my own self out of the way. I hope I'm not blocking. Um, so, you know, definitely these treaty debates and the cabinet debates in particular later on are where a lot of the animosity between the likes of Griffiths uh, or, you know, yeah, Griffith and Childers and, and Collins and Brewer, you know, comes to the fore. Um, so Cahill Brewer, you know, kind of snarkily comments that the minister, the British government had selected its men. Now, don't forget, these men were asked by de Valera. Austin Stack refused to go. Cahill Brewer refused to go. Collins didn't particularly want to go this time. He might have preferred to go in August or July, you know, when the, the first round happened, because they all knew that this was a, a sort of a, you know, you were not going to get any more concessions out of them. So uh, this is what was going on there on the third the, in that cabinet meeting. So on the fifth, they go back. Um, the, the team are back in London. Here's Arthur Griffith talking to de Valera about what was going on and definitely, you know, trying to get some concessions on exactly what Dominion status meant. Um, also, you know, this idea of belonging in the empire. So you can see here the talks actually almost broke down. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but, you know, basically talks really did almost break down because of Gavin Duffy kind of saying, oh, we don't really want to be, you know, in <laughs> in that. Um, so this was on the 4th of December before the, you know, the bigger thing kind of happened. So they were going to say that Craig, they were going to British delegation were going to tell Craig that the talks had broken down and everybody kind of went home that night. Then Lloyd George requested a meeting with Michael Collins the next morning. 
and um here they are you know here's this what's basically happening griffith came that you should go and meet with him collins kind of felt you know we obviously were at an impasse i don't believe i should go and so he was saying that the break should be on the question of within or without the empire um and this was of course very bad news in one way for the irish um collins argued that he was concerned about the north and you know i wanted to secure a definite reply from craig and his colleagues um in terms of the boundary commission uh so there you know there was a few concessions given on the fifth i'm just looking through my notes um you know so this exhausting recriminatory inconclusive cabinet meeting in dublin they had agreed basically to kind of reject the terms make a fresh attempt at a deal bring any new deal back to dublin for discussion um they wanted a compromise on the All Ireland Republic, but acknowledging that Ulster would probably retain a subsidiary parliament. De Valera's external association appeal was intended to offer the compromise of close association with, but not within the British Empire. And again, you know, we can argue about the semantics of that. Uh, but this was absolutely the breaking point for Britain. They would not tolerate an independent Ireland outside of the empire. Um, so, you know, having sort of assumed that Michael Collins would be the hardliner, he, of course, knows that the Irish army are basically exhausted. And so there's nothing that they can do, um, you know, that their backs are against the wall. So here is this conference on the night of the 5th and 6th. And this is the, the absolutely um, breaking point. You know, they had to find out. Lloyd George wants to know exactly where they stand. Um, Ulster is where it is, says Lloyd George, like we have not heard back kind of thing from Craig. And so uh, Lloyd George gets excited. He shook his papers. He declared that we were trying deliberately to bring about a break on Ulster because of our people in Ireland who refused to come in with the empire. And that Arthur Griffith, don't forget, Arthur Griffith had kind of amorphously a couple of weeks ago said that he would not allow the talks to break on that. Um, Arthur agreed to his contents that, you know, he had said he wouldn't break down on, on the north. So Arthur Griffith is kind of backed into a corner. He does concede, Lloyd George does concede a little bit on trade. Um, there would be freedom on both sides to impose tariffs that they would like. And then they go back to Ulster. Griffith agreed that he personally would sign the treaty, whether Craig accepted or not, but that, you know, the colleagues had not given their word and so they couldn't. Our, Lloyd George stated that he had always taken it that Arthur Griffith spoke for the delegation, that we were all plenipotentiaries and that it is now a matter of peace and war and we must each of us make up our minds. Um, so that's kind of, you know, where it's happening. He stood up basically and took two envelopes out of his pocket in one he said was the draft treaty that the british were proposing that the irish should sign in the other was a note saying the irish had rejected the terms the new session of the northern irish parliament was due to open the next day and lloyd george said he had promised craig that he would report the result from the negotiations a special train he said was waiting with steam up at euston station in london uh which was going to a destroyer in hollyhead which would go back to craig to meet his deadline Lloyd George needed the Irish to sign or reject the treaty tonight by 10 p.m. If the Irish rejected, he said it would be war and war within three days. Um, he's, the Irish were outraged. Michael Collins rose, looking as though he were going to shoot someone, Winston Churchill recalled, but they left to consider the ultimatum. So whether or not Lloyd George is making an empty threat here of war, I suppose it's not really a gamble that they felt they could take. Um, I will say there was a lot of all along, even though Ireland was at a treaty, a truce with Great Britain, they were redeploying troops that had been freed up now after the World War One and after the Treaty of Versailles and everything. So there were quietly British troops entering Ireland every day. They had completed a sort of an all around the country radio network that would have been what, you know, left them in a much better position than they had pre the truce in July. So by December of 1921, that network was up and running. And so there's absolutely, even though he had threatened Lloyd George to resign before he would oversee a renewed military campaign in Ireland, it would have been quite easy for England to mobilize um, substantial troops in England. So this was kind of where they're at. They go back to Hans Place. Here it is and discuss themselves the treaty. That's just members of the, the broader Irish team. So here are um, 
I think Martin's notes maybe um, from the meetings. Uh, you know, so it was quite intense, the conversation for them. I think Martin broke down crying. You know, he, he really did not want to bend. And it was listening to the testimony of the men about people who had been shot in, you know, after 1916, but also the war itself, you know, that so actually with tears in his eyes, Barton was the last one to kind of give in and he did. So here we have these notes. Lloyd George asked whether we as a delegation were prepared to accept the articles of agreement and to stand by them in our parliament as they as a delegation would stand by them. And there is don't forget, both governments have to ratify the treaties even after they're signed. Griffith replied, we do. The final draft was read over, agreed to and signed. The British delegation lined up to shake hands and say goodbye and the conference ended at 2.20 a.m. on the morning of the 6th. Churchill observed that Michael Collins rose looking as though he was going to shoot someone, preferably himself. In all my life, I have never seen so much pain and suffering and restraint. Birkenhead, who was, of course, don't forget, a diehard kind of unionist conservative, sighed and said, I may have signed my political death warrant tonight. Collins shot back, I have signed my actual death warrant. So the treaty was a short document. It began by declaring that the Irish Free State would have the same constitutional status as the dominions of Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the South African Union. Um, this was a higher status than previously sought home rule for Ireland. And it was an achievement really that was unimaginable even 16 years earlier when Sinn Féin was founded. The representative of the king in Ireland would be appointed in the same way that the governor general in Canada would be. Contrary to popular belief, the final agreement does not require the Dáil deputies to swear an oath of allegiance to the king. It's the oath of allegiance is to the constitution of the Irish Free State with an oath of faithfulness to the monarch. But of course, any oath to the king really offended the sensibilities of, of many of the Dáil uh, deputies and a lot of the fighting men. Of course, Ireland would remain in the British Empire. Uh, for the first time in an official UK document, the term Commonwealth was used as an alternative to empire in consideration of Irish feelings and also the improving kind of status of dominions. The treaty gave the state financial freedom, although the Irish agreed to pay a debt, a share of the existing public debt. Um, and until the Irish government could mount their own coastal defence, Article 6 ensured that British forces were responsible for the defence by sea of Britain and Ireland. They were, um, the Free State would let Britain use certain harbours and facilities that would be named. And of course, there was resentment that Britain would retain these treaty ports, only three of them, uh, Queenstown, as it was called, which is now Cove, Bearhaven and Loxwilly. The issue of the treaty ports was significant because I suppose technically it made Irish neutrality really like impractical or impossible in the event of a war. But that was already negotiated out in 19 or that would be negotiated out in 1938 with the conclusion of the Coal Cattle Pact. Uh, the Irish state agreed to pay fair compensation to public servants who would retire, you know, from the change of government if they didn't want to serve the Irish state, uh, but not to auxiliaries or black and tans. And of course, the treaty gave Northern Ireland the right to opt out of this new Irish state. But if it did, a boundary commission would be set up to, quote, determine the, in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants, the boundaries between Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland. Griffith and Collins definitely believed that at least Tyrone and Fermanagh would then be transferred because of, you know, popular vote uh, to the free state. But of course, what happens uh, is that the two of those men die. The Boundary Commission kind of flounders between 22 and 25 and it never happens. So there's the treaty itself signed. Um, that's the last page. Now, and here are the team are having signed it, except for Griffith. Now, uh, so they go home. De Valera naturally is uh, not impressed, you know, on the 7th of December, let me see, the, the cabinet meet at home, De Valera, Brewer, Stack, Cosgrave and O'Higgins. On the insistence of Cosgrave, they agree to hear out the delegation before they make any movement towards rejecting the treaty. Um, and you can see here, I think there's a very interesting little point. De Valera uh, ordered that they be taken back. There was kind of words drafted for a publication. Desmond Fitzgerald, who was in charge of publicity, came into the room and said, this might be altered, Mr. President. It reads as if you were opposed to the settlement. 
That is the way I intended to read, publish it as it is, the president told him. Fitzgerald said, um, this is Austin Stack now, don't forget, who was, you know, an anti-treaty. Fitzgerald said aside to me a few minutes later, I didn't think he was against this kind of settlement before we went over to London. I answered, he's dead against it now anyway, and that's enough. So even within his own team, De Valera seems to be kind of flip-flopping. Then we have a meeting of the cabinet on the 8th. Um, both De Valera, Brewer, Stack, Cosgrave and O'Higgins are joined now by Griffith, Collins and Barton, who have come home. Gavin Duffy, Duggan and Childers, who of course are not in the cabinet, but were plenty potentiaries, were invited to attend. Uh, Childers was just uh, the secretary, he wasn't on the delegation. The main focus would be on how the delegates came to sign the document. Um, and so this was, you know, very, very intense, very, very personal. Um, Austin Stack, you know, said that he was on the side of Carl Brew and the president. Um, of course, you're know, in rejecting it. Uh, he, I turned to Collins, he said, and spoke of the way the country would be divided and said imploringly, you have signed and undertaken to recommend the document. Well, recommend it. Your duty stops there. But Collins refused point blank to dishonor his signature. And so, you know, Collins was saying, we made a deal. You can't kind of say, oh, we wanted a better deal. I, I signed the treaty and now we have to kind of argue, you know, for it. So they, all of these talks were supposed to be more or less, you know, sort of secret. De Valera rejected the treaty, but the cabinet did vote uh, four to three to approve it. So Collins, Griffith, Barton and Cosgrave voted yes. De Valera, Brew and Stack voted against. Now, the next day, De Valera um leaked a letter to the press explaining his position austin stack says that the treaty and all the propaganda pro treaty had started three days ahead of time you know when it was signed on the 6th but that's not i think really true the british and irish press carried the people off their feet he says in favor of the treaty and peace um you know i don't think necessarily that that is correct but there was definitely an understanding i suppose in ireland that the treaty had been signed you know uh, whether people got the niceties that there would now be a debate i'm not sure so there's austin stack who would later on you know argue very vociferously against the treaty and here's extracts from de valera's letter to the press you have seen in the public press the text of the proposed treaty with Great Britain. The terms are in violent conflict with the wishes of the majority of the nation, as expressed freely in successive elections during the last three years. Again, that's kind of a bold claim. You know, yes, they did supplant the Home Rule Party, but I don't know that the the semantics of the difference between external association and dominion status, like I don't know if most people knew or understood those differences. Uh, you know, and I do think kind of peace might have been the number one thing in most people's minds. He said, I feel it my duty to inform you immediately that I cannot uh, recommend the acceptance of the treaty either to Dáil Éireann or the country. In this attitude, I am supported by the ministers of Home Affairs, that's Stack and Defence, Carl Brewer. A public session of Dáil Éireann is being scheduled for Wednesday next week. The great test of our people has come. Let us face it worthily, without bitterness and above all, without recriminations. There is a definite constitutional way of resolving our differences. So, of course, that changes within a number of months. So here are some pictures about the crowds on Earlsford Terrace. They decide to have the public hearing not in the mansion house where the government meets, but at Earlsford Terrace. Uh, and there were some issues with that, too, I will tell you. Um, so they were cheered, you know, by um, a hugely earnest crowd when they arrived to discuss the treaty. Uh, I'm just looking at my dates. I don't want to kind of miss anything. So yeah, they, they, the treaty debates start on the 14th. So here are some of them uh, arriving in. There's Austin Stack with a kind of, you know, floppy looking hat. Um, I think that might be Harry Boland in the back. There's a few people coming in, you know, so huge crowds. And this is the thing too, like they are being absolutely observed, uh, not just by Irish people, but actually there's press from around the world. Here's Arthur Griffith coming in. This is actually, if anyone has been in Dublin, this is now the National Concert Hall. So um you it used to be ucd um campus so this is the room where the treaty debates take place and you can see it's really not set up for this so the the cabinet and all of them meet back here um this is where like the public sits there's about a hundred press people from all around the world in here and they can barely hear the speakers so there's an awful lot of you know kind of shouting and and toing and froing up at the top. But I think basically they hold it here because they did not want public galleries, um, which would be available 
in the doll building to kind of overtake the debate. So you can see how packed in they are like that. You know, here's the government. There's Michael Collins. You know, the the cabinet are sitting here at that table. There's Arthur Griffith. And then this is, um, you know, the, the press. But they can barely hear these people when they stand up to speak the, the rest of the doll. So the Kian Kohirla or the, the main speaker is um, Owen McNeil. I, I think I had a picture of him. It might be later on. Um, so he was the deputy for Derry City and um, the Northern or the National University of Ireland constituencies. Uh, so he was one of five TDs who represented constituencies on both sides of the border. Professor Owen McNeil was the speaker uh, since August. Faced with unclear parliamentary procedures and inexperienced members, of course, combined with high stakes and very fraught nerves, McNeil did his best at what he described as a troublesome and tiresome job. To one side of him sat De Valera, who was with Stack and Brewer, facing Griffith, Collins and Cosgrave on the other side. The clerk called the roll and prayers were said by the chaplain, Reverend Dr. Brown. And of course, the very, so here's just the roll call and everything. The first bone of contention was whether the doll should meet even in public or private. Um, Waterford Deputy White proposed private sittings because the deputies would be more likely to speak freely. And there were certainly, you know, issues with, I will say, like involvement in the IRA. They didn't necessarily want how much arms and ammunition were out there. In fact, Carl Brewer's statements are kept secret in Ireland, even uh, they weren't written down. So there, there is that issue that like, how much are we going on record with publicly? Uh, but I will say Michael Collins and Carl Brewer wanted public sessions, but they do agree with Richard Mulcahy's amendment that the Dole first debate, the merits of the treaty in public, uh, the debate, uh, sorry, so the, the treaty merits would be public, but the genesis and all of that kind of stuff in private, which they thought would conclude that first evening. So what lingers on then for days, to be honest, is this the debate about the instructions given to the plenipotentiaries and whether they had exceeded the mandate given them by Dáil Air during those private settings. And remember, I told you in October, the cabinet gave them one set of instructions and the larger parliament gave them a different set. So and Devil Air publicly said, you know, that they had to have the full trust of the people and all of these things. So it was very, I think, uh, unfair of De Valera to kind of bring this up because they really were told publicly, you have full power to conclude and sign a treaty, even though privately the instructions were run everything by us before you sign. Um, so they discussed the, those settings in a private um, in private session. De Valera argued that the treaty represented voting away Ireland's independence and that since Dáil Éireann had no authority to do that, it was, you know, they, incompatible kind of with reality. The meeting continued for hours in a very chaotic fashion. Uh, you can be reading those notes there. Despite the speaker's assertion that he was chairing with a rod of iron, the business of the session was unclear. Collins, among others, complained it was impossible to speak without interruption, and at least one deputy complained that the doll had wasted practically the whole day. They concluded proceedings at 9.30 that night, and absolutely no progress had been made. And again, like this is really like, why are you debating something that has already happened? You know, the plenipotentiaries went, they signed a treaty, now they're back. It's almost ridiculous kind of arguing about the status of your, you know, credentials after you've used them, you know. So the next day, I'm just going to go through my slides. There is Owen McNeil at the count quarter, the, the speaker. On the 15th, the doll went back into a private session at about lunchtime. Eamon de Valera, as president, indicated that he thought it would only last for the afternoon and that the public session would be resumed the next morning. Um, I'm just going to leave these quotes up and every now and then I'll comment on them. The doll, in fact, private session continued um, again on Thursday and for two more days. It didn't resume public talks until Monday, the 19th of, the de of December. So the discussion on the credentials of the plenipotentiaries continued again. Um, an ad hoc committee was set up to decide which documents would be put before the House had made its recommendations. Uh, but now there were demands that Robert Barton's notes should be circulated along with debate on their status. Um, the plenipotentiaries gave statements which really degenerated into a, a to and fro about their credentials and about their um, their intentions even. So. 
And then it takes this kind of left turn. The substantive matter before the doll was supposed to be the adoption, or not, of the Articles of Agreement which were signed in London. De Valera quickly, and I hope I have it here. So this is all penitentiary stuff. Uh, I should have put up that a minute ago. De Valera had come up with a plan now, uh, you know, on the 13th of December uh, or thereabouts to counter, as he said, treaty with treaty. I'll come back to De Valera's, uh, to those conversations in a minute. So this, I want you to just look at this while I'm talking. It was a hastily, this number two, as he calls it, was a hastily drafted document, um, a compromise, he thought, that was so similar in many ways to the treaty. But rather than envisioning Ireland as part of the Commonwealth, it proposed that the relationship with Britain and the Commonwealth be one of external association, not dominion status. Um, and he famously kind of drew two circles that touched but didn't intersect, you know, like a, a Venn diagram, but without the Venn. Um, this was just, you know, absolutely sort of preposterous. Uh, Collins argued that the word, I put it here on the side, was so vague that the British would interpret it any way they want. And the biggest thing for Collins was if they were not properly a dominion, then they wouldn't have the support of other dominions if there was a showdown with the British. Whereas at least he kind of felt, you know, the Union of South Africa, don't forget, Smuts had been integral in, in getting the, the both sides to even to agree to the truce. So he felt that that was kind of important. So de Valera withdraws document number two at the end of the private session on the 18th of December. Now I'll go back um, this, but there's the being potentially. So um, you can just, I'm, I'm kind of gone ahead of myself with the slides, so I'll leave them here. But uh, Sean T. Kelly followed de Valera, who supported, by the way, um, document two, because he thought it would save the country from the consequences of a Parnell split or worse. Owen McNeil, trying to regain control of the meeting, said the only matter on which the Dáil could vote was whether the articles of agreement that had been signed in London were agreed or not. Very, very tense session, testy exchanges between Childers and Arthur Griffith, who had been technically both together in London, you know. Um, the Speaker had to kind of intervene there and beg for calm. George Gavin Duffy proposed that the Dáil should continue in private session for another day uh, in an attempt to kind of clear the air and many had not yet spoken, so to give them a choice, a chance. Uh, other people were very conscious of time. Griffiths said, if we defer our decision beyond Saturday at the latest, you will have trouble in the country. I think we will have to hold a public session on Saturday. If we go over the weekend, people will get impatient and they will cry out, why has not the Dáil been able to make up its mind? So the Dáil agreed to meet in private the next day and consider the confidential documents that were to be put before them. On December 16th, which is technically the third day, it was 40 minutes late beginning the business um, because it had to consider eight documents, which were basically, again, the credentials of the plenipotentiaries, the instructions to them, the various memoranda back and forth from uh, Griffith and Childers and Barton, all of them, the actual treaty, the secretary's notes from meetings on the 25th of November and the 3rd of December, amendments by the Irish representatives, which they had brought back from the meeting on the third with them to the fourth and which were included most of them in the treaty. And then Robert Barton's notes of those two kind of sub conferences on the 5th and 6th of December. So um, the copies of these documents had to be signed for and returned. Um, no notes were allowed to be taken of their contents and they were not to be brought outside of the council chamber. So, you know, really there was a lot of hush hush and secrecy around the, this side of the debates um then you know they just had kind of procedural things talking about whips and could they not shorten the speeches and all of that sean mcintyre finally spoke at length and his contribution was important because he was one of the few that mentioned ulster and partition uh, this was a subject that was largely absent from the debates before or after his speech um he also referred to the debates that were at the same time happening in Westminster. So, you know, both governments, don't forget, had to um, ratify it. So the Dáil was continuing to address even just, you know, the whole background to the plenipotentiaries. The House of Commons voted 401 to 58 to present the address to the King approving the treaty. Uh, the same address passed the House of Lords three days later. So, um, 
it was not until, of course, 1922 with an Act of Parliament that was passed, but basically West, Westminster ratified the treaty almost immediately. So by the end of the third day of private talks, matters had not progressed. Confidential documents had been largely unread and undiscussed because there was too much, you know, um, red tape around accessing them. And so they have yet another private session uh, necessary. So Collins, uh, or yeah, Collins and De Valera issue kind of a joint statement to the public, reassuring them that there are things happening in Aerosford Terrace. The House adjourned at 9.50 p.m. and made laughter at WTK, WT Cosgrave's suggestion that the doll adopt an American fashion where the members of the Senate or the Congress could hand in their speeches so that they may be read by whoever wishes to read them. Have we any chance of getting that done here so as to save some time? And everybody laughed. So the final private session on the 17th, uh, the fourth day, these newspapers printed that joint statement to say that this is the last private station and that the motion on approval, i.e. to accept or deny the treaty, would be in public session on Monday. Very little progress again over this past 18 hours. But now attention turned to the question of what would happen if this body failed to come to an agreement and whether it had the capacity to carry on fighting what Kevin O'Higgins described as intensified war. General Sean McOwen, who spoke as a plain soldier who realizes what it is to be at war, put it bluntly. If England goes to war again, she will wipe out all as she was prepared to wipe out in the latter end of the late war. He was far from alone in suggesting this. McOwen took issue with the claim of the Minister for Defence, Carl Brewer, who said that the army was at that point much stronger than it was before the treaty. Sean Etchingham, a hardliner, remained unmoved, stating, I may be a diehard, but it is better to die hard than soft. Terence McSweeney died hard. He was over 90 days dying. What did he die for? Did he die for this thing that is before us? McSweeney's sister, Mary, answered that he had not. And so that was the dividing line for most of that day's private session. They heard from McSweeney, uh, Kathleen Clark, whose husband Tom and her brother Edward Daly had been executed after 1916. They heard from Margaret Pierce, who said she would be haunted by the ghosts of her sons, Patrick and Willie, were she to vote for the treaty, of course, had been executed in 1916. All six women deputies, uh, McSweeney, Clark and Pierce, with Madame Markovich, Dr Ada English and Kate O'Callaghan, opposed the treaty. Um, if in stark contrast to the women's contribution, most of the military men's contributions were in favour of approval, the Minister for Defence, Cahal Brewer, was not among them. Brewer was adamant that they could and should fight on. But his contribution towards the end of the day's proceedings were regarded as too sensitive and, and were not recorded. The official report notes, Brua made a statement in reply to the last speaker as to how the army stood. Essentially, or eventually, 20 minutes shy of midnight, the House adjourned, finally bringing the secret or private sessions to an end. So these public sessions. Uh, on the 19th, the deputies arrived at Earls for Terrace for their first public debate since the 14th, and they could not help but notice the placards and the crowds outside the doors. Um, there were signs saying, stand by Collins and the treaty, others stated up the Republic or no free state. So the motion on the treaty was to be, uh, was to be debated and the public were determined to have their say. After the roll call, the speaker announced that at the president's request, document number two, that external association, which had been discussed uh, in secret and had been withdrawn from discussion and should remain confidential. So document two was now not being put forward as an alternative. Arthur Griffith was anxious that it not be withheld from the public, but he was concerned that it was difficult to avoid the contents um, during the debate. He tried to, he reluctantly agreed to try to avoid the document, but said he would not hide from the Irish people the proposed alternative. De Valera's unwillingness to publish the document continued to annoy Griffith over the coming days, but technically the matter before the House was the motion that Dáil Éireann approves of the treaty between Great Britain and Ireland signed in London on December 6th. As Griffith began to put his case for the treaty, a legion of journalists and telegraph messengers pushed forward to listen. He was characteristically measured and direct, and his argument appealed more to reason than emotion. Although there was confusion because they kept referencing document number two, which nobody had seen at this point. Uh, Griffith's motion to accept the treaty was seconded by General Sean McCone, who spoke briefly and put forward a pro-treaty case that was repeated. To me, symbols, recognitions, shadows have very little meaning. To me, this treaty gives me 
what I and my comrades fought for. It gives us for the first time in 700 years, the evacuation of Britain's armed forces out of Ireland. De Valera was said to have electrified the room, although his speech is pretty kind of pedantic on paper. Griffith drew on Thomas Davis, but de Valera drew on Parnell, emphasizing that the treaty would restrict, quote, the onward march of a nation, which remember um, Parnell had famously said, no nation has the right to stop, you know, the march of a nation. De Valera's stance was reinforced later on in the day by Austin Stack, Count Plunkett and Erskine Childers. Both de Valera and Griffith's speeches were applauded and observers remarked it would have been a wise person who could have told them which attracted the most support. Michael Collins took the floor in the afternoon. Um, so there's the speech. We have brought back the flag. We have brought back the evacuation of Ireland after 700 years. Michael Collins took the floor. The note taker's pencils began to scratch furiously. He, he supported and defended his signature in London, speaking animatedly, excuse me, hammering home, excuse me, um, I'll come back to that speech. I just want to show you this one. Oh, Lord. Yeah, there it is. There's Michael Collins' speech. Um, he said, the freedom, the treaty gives us freedom, not the ultimate freedom that all nations desire and develop to, but the freedom to achieve it. On Ulster, which took up very little time, as I've said in the debates, he claims that the treaty would lead to, quote, goodwill and the entry of the North East under the Irish Parliament. The f last word was granted to Robert Barton, whose speech attracted much press coverage the following morning. Um, alluding to Lloyd George's threat of immediate war if the treaty had not been signed, Barton admitted he preferred the option of war, but he could not accept responsibility for it. And for this reason, he said he had offered his signature. So he's, he's explaining there, you know, what happened and kind of the pressure they were under that night. He said, for myself, I preferred war. I told my colleagues so, but for the nation, without consultation, I dared not accept that responsibility. The alternative which I sought to avoid seemed to me a lesser outrage than the violation of what is my faith, so that I myself and of my own choice must commit to my nation to immediate war without you, Mr. President, or the members of the Dáil, or the nation having an opportunity to examine the terms upon which war could be avoided. I signed, and now I have fulfilled my undertaking, I recommend to you the treaty I signed in London. So, you know, it's very, um, yeah, very kind of obvious um, support here from, of course, the ones who signed it. Here's um, Sean McOwen, who very clearly stated, despite Carl Brewer, you know, that the, the doll would be ready. He said that he had one rifle for one man in 50 in his unit. For that one rifle, he had enough ammunition for 50 minutes hard fighting. And the quote was, those who speak lightly of war do not know a damn thing about it. This treaty brings the freedom that is necessary. It brings the freedom that we were all ready to die for. So you can see, you know, they're getting a lot of press, lots of different photographs of everybody, you know, coming to and fro. Uh, the pressure is on. There's Mary McSweeney. Uh, that's not her in Dublin. That's was here in America. Um. So, so the next session is the 20th of December. Deputies were half an hour late uh, this morning and they began their business with procedural disarray because it was the last minute change to the agenda. De Valera decided he did want to introduce a motion on document number two after the vote on the treaty, although the document had still not been formally put before the House, don't forget, because it was only discussed kind of in those secret, um, the secret talks. Sean Etchingham set the wheels in motion for the anti-treatyites, emphasizing what he considered to be the horrors of Dominion status and the oath of allegiance. He said that those who gave their lives since 1916 had not done so for colonial home rule. Appeals to the dead were becoming so common that the next speaker, Fanon Lynch, saw fit to exclaim, the bones of the dead have been rattled indecently in the face of this assembly. This was an accusation often directed towards the women deputies. Um, so, I do want to talk about the women. Hang on for one second. So we've seen that there's, so here's the women, Countess Markievicz and Kathleen Lynn arriving. Um, there's another man, Count Plunkett, you know, I'm faithful to the dead. I'm faithful to my own boys, one of whom died for Ireland with his back to the wall and the other two who were sentenced. You know, I am no more an enemy of peace than Arthur Griffith, but I will never sacrifice the independence of Ireland for simply for the purpose of securing a secession of warfare. Again, kind of bold words. Um, 
we've done those. I'll come back. So here's yeah the women. Uh, the women, yeah, were incredibly, you know, important. They they did reference the kind of dead husbands and sons and brothers and all of that. Um, Patrick McCartan was another man who, don't forget, was very involved in Irish America, in fact, lived in America. Uh, he said he put his name down to speak against it, apparently as a maneuver to make his speech more dramatic, but he, um, he supported the treaty. He caught a striking figure because kind of criticized both sides of the cabinet, concluding that they had both betrayed the Republic. But then finally, Michael Collins suggested that the debate should continue after Christmas to give every deputy a chance to speak because this was supposed to be the original deadline. Um, he also commanded all deputies to be on time the following morning. So the next day, the 21st of December, there's Sean T. O'Callaghan. Yeah, so that was one of the speeches on the 20th. We should throw back at England this instrument of our subversion. We should stand shoulder to shoulder in this act as we did in the fight. There should be no two sides on this vital question. And he said, I cannot bear to live to see such a man as Arthur Griffith or men such as Michael Collins, you know, um, acting as ministers and generals in the name of His Majesty King George V. There's the women again. So don't forget, um, Kate O'Callaghan, you know, and had been the woman in Limerick whose husband was shot basically right in front of her. Kathleen Clark, of course, you have there and Margaret Pierce. So, it, you know, it wasn't looking good on these days, the last couple of days of December. I'm just going to fly through these. That was it. OK, good. Now we can come back. So um, the next day they hear from two plenipotentiaries who had not yet spoken, George Gavin Duffy and Eamon Duggan. Um, both men actually did recommend the treaty. Duffy, whose head and heart were at odds over it, claimed that his signature had been extorted from him by the threat of war, but Duggan said he signed it freely. Duggan's comments on the Oath of Allegiance drew the ire of de Valera, who offered a clarification on his alternative oath. Um, de Valera, or Collins, I mean, sorry, after lunch, drew attention to comments made in the morning by particularly J.J. Walsh, which were inaccurately reported by the press. He thought the speeches should be made in front of the speaker's chair so that the journalists at the back of the room could hear better. According to one journalist, the acoustics were so poor that not one sentence of a 15 minute speech in, made in the morning could be heard. Um, that afternoon, the second last day, Cosgrave employed all the tricks of a seasoned orator, attacked every argument he had heard against the oath of allegiance. I'm just going back here. Um, I thought I had ones from the women. Anyway, uh, the Oath of Allegiance, which he claimed would could be interpreted any way one liked. Cosgrave's dry tone introduced welcome levity to the proceedings and de Valera had to laugh when, he, when Cosgrave sent up the president's mathematical approach to pro politics. He said, if X be absolute independence and Y be independence, we are told that we are abandoning what is the relative value of X and Y to one another. But there was no laughter during the contribution which followed because Mary McSweeney delivered a scathing invective against compromise that took almost three hours. As she warmed up, she is reported to have removed her hat, her scarf, collar and her coat. Um, and as she did so, certain members uh, gently and quietly removed themselves from the room. According to the Irish Times, she was eloquent, tearful, ironic, fervent, reproachful, implacable. But bitterness was the driving force behind her every word, and a more unprofitable speech could not be imagined. De Valera later remarked that he thought her speech in particular, but those of the women. And again, it's interesting that they're kind of calling the women's speeches, you know, emotional and all that. Um, he thinks their speeches affected the final vote. By close of day, the two sides were almost head to head. Fifteen deputies had spoken in favour of the treaty, 13 against. With so many still to speak, and no ruling to limit the length of speeches, the prospect of concluding before Christmas became increasingly bleak. A frustrated Arthur Griffith asked members, uh, said that members should be able to say what they have to say in 10 to 15 minutes. Um, you know, he, this attempt to limit the debate. On the 22nd of December, uh, weariness was evident on the face of every deputy, but most notably de Valera, who by now appeared haggard and pale. Evident also were the many empty seats when the Speaker called the House to order. Debate fatigue was taking its toll. If a sense of decorum had existed on day one, it had now given way to slackness. 
to such an extent that some members succumb to, to the temptation to smoke while listening to the proceedings. They forgot that the world was watching. And so, um, despite the prospect of yet another day of repetitious speeches without time constraints, deputies had few olive branches to hand, and every so often well-intended remarks lapsed into self-righteousness or sloganeering. Damn the treaty was the watchword of Tipperary uh, TD PG Maloney, and hands off the Republic would be that of Sean Moylan, an uncompromising re Republican from North Cork. Professor Michael Hale, Hale, or, sorry, Hayes of the National University spoke first that morning, and he argued that the treaty would give Ireland unprecedented status abroad. Next up was Minister for Education, Sean O'Callagh, who condemned the treaty as an ins insult to the memory of martyred comrades. His remarks were echoed by Kathleen Clark. Um, the position of the Irish language was a matter that several speakers raised during the debates, which had largely been held, of course, in English. It was emphasised in particular by Gaelic League founder Podrigo Moglia, who, like um, Sean O'Callagh, wished that the entire business had been conducted through Irish. Liam de Roche, de, or Roche, defending the treaty in the afternoon, went so far as to imply that if deputies contributed only in Irish, then the quibbling over words that characterised the debate in English would not arise. This in particular related to the difference between a free state and a republic, because their thought and public were used interchangeably in Irish. So that's actually an interesting uh, take on things. Richard Mulcahy, the chief of staff of the IRA, also began in Irish. He went on to confess that while de Valera's alternative had not received the airing that it should have, he could see no option but to accept the treaty. When the speaker, Owen McNeill, stepped down from the chair to speak, he claimed anti-treaty contributions should have, made, should have been made before the plenipotentiaries were sent to London. And that was the big thing that Michael Collins said in one of his speeches, I hope I put it in here, that the, 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 um, he says it here, the acceptance of the invitation was what formed the compromise. I was sent there to form that adaptation and to bear the brunt of it. So there is this kind of idea among certainly the, the pro-treaty people that there was not a lot more that anyone you know could have gotten. Um, so basically, the two positions boil down to Eamon de Valera saying it is absolutely inconsistent with our position. It gives away Irish independence and it brings us into the British Empire. I mean, I suppose you could argue it didn't bring them in. They had already been directly ruled by Britain since the Act of Union in 1800. You know, so um, that's kind of not true, although I suppose legally, you know, they're they're opting into the union. Um, and Michael Collins says it gives us freedom, not the ultimate freedom that all nations develop and desire and develop, but the freedom to achieve it. Albina had to be escorted out um, uh, after the hours of um, denunciation uh, that, that her friend Mary McSweeney gave. There's Sean T. O'Callagh. Uh, I just want to make sure I've shown you all. So they were, you know, very nervous uh, on that last day. At the end of the day, the Belfast newsletter dubbed this last day as wild. And then finally, the question of suspending until after Christmas arose. De Valera wanted the, date, the debate to be concluded on the following day, but Michael Collins proposed a motion to adjourn until the 3rd of January. Sean McEntee, who saw grave, nation, grave national danger in adjourning, objected. But Collins's motion, funnily enough, was seconded by Madame Markievicz, and it was carried. While Christmas may have been saved, uh, as these men return home to their parishes and women, the relieved deputies buttoned their overcoats to a stern injunction from de Valera. There must be a common agreement that there will be no speech making in the interval. Now, that's very interesting because um, that is not, I suppose, what happens realistically. They, everyone goes home. They're happy to do so, but it is when they come back to the meetings that um, the will of the country is kind of has sort of, I think, shocked the men, to be honest, in how much support at home there was for the treaty. Um, now, I one quick word I wanted to say about this was um, Craig gave a speech in the north of Ireland, absolutely lambasting England for what he thinks is giving in too much to the will of Sinn Féin. So there, it's a kind of a famous speech. Many people think it's talking about that they were used as fools. But actually, he thinks, you know, that Sinn Féin got way too many um, 
way too many concessions. Um, so I thought that was interesting and that might be my last slide. It is. So I'll just very quickly um, kind of give you a rundown of some historians views and then we'll talk about uh, one or two questions. So the Dole sessions, um, this is according to Arthur Mitchell, uh, in August, demonstrated that the executive was not going to hold out for a fully independent state. This now is according to, as I say, um, historians who look at it later on. The British government simply could not have this a fully independent Ireland. There was a general recognition within the counter state that a return to guerrilla warfare could not would not change this position. What was needed was an arrangement with Britain that would satisfy Irish nationalist aspirations as well as British defence concerns. Collins himself did not want to go, but de Valera pushed him into it. Neither Brewer or Stack would go, and nobody expected them to go. Neither man, he says, had demonstrated intellectual subtlety or capacity. They were simple men with simple ideas. But here was a recipe for conflict, because whatever terms Collins and company brought back, Stack and Brewer would not be able to resist the opportunity to attack their arch rival. And of course, they had no skin in the game because they hadn't attended the talks. Uh, so that was Arthur Mitchell and revolutionary government in Ireland. Joseph Lee wrote in Politics and Society, Ireland 1912 to 1985, Politics and Society. It really did not make sense, he says, for the best player, as W.T. Cosgrave rightly called him, to remain a non-playing captain in the biggest match his team was ever likely to play. James Craig represented Northern Ireland's case in negotiations himself with the British. Lloyd George, with a far busier schedule, and presiding over a potentially awkward, and we know it was an awkward cabinet because it was a coalition government, made sure to lead his team. So, you know, does the final blame sort of le le rest with de Valera? Michael Laffin said in the partition of Ireland, in the final round of negotiations, Lloyd George used carrot and stick with equal effectiveness. The British gave way on many points, in particular agreeing that members of the Irish Parliament should be obliged to take a mere oath of fidelity to the King in his role as head of state, in place of the more distasteful oath of allegiance. But the prime minister had also threatened immediate and terrible war if an agreement were not concluded. Almost all the gloomy forecasts of British interference in the free state's affairs and the limitations on its sovereignty would be disproved by events. And in the 1930s, it was de Valera who made good Collins's claim that the treaty gave Ireland not the ultimate freedom that all nations and aspire to, but the freedom to achieve it. So de Valera, you know, after the that economic war in the 1930s with the Coal Cattle Pact, did kind of embrace what Collins had said. And then one of the more um, newer kind of or, or more recent historians, Dermot Ferreter in the Transformation of Ireland wrote, the truce in July and de Valera's speedy journey to London was the beginning of the end to the claim for the right to a republic. What was on offer was dominion status. That such terms were rejected was not perhaps as important as their potential to sow the seeds of division within a movement that had traditionally, at home in Ireland, been a mixture of moderates and hardliners. The eventual signing of the treaty was partly a generational compromise between what the older Griffith uh, represented and the younger Collins sought. It was a compromise between dominion status and the elusive republic. The agreement reflected a desire to avoid a further debilitating military war, which both sides, uh, Britain as well as Ireland, knew they could not win. So it's, you know, I think um, those speeches, you know, really get to the heart of the problem. And I suppose, you know, it's very difficult looking back on whether or not they were right to sacrifice their principles, um, whether or not you believed Lloyd George. You know, I don't even know if if we need to know whether he was bluffing or not. Like the simple fact of the matter was, in order for the Irish to get the machinery of war back up and running, it wasn't going to happen. You know, we saw the IRA men testify that they had one gun for one man in 50, you know, that they didn't have bullets beyond 50 minutes. Michael Collins thought they would not be able to fight beyond six weeks. Um, Michael Collins was now known and very visible. It would probably have been very easy to arrest him any day, walking in and out of Earl's Ford Terrace there, having those debates. You know, I just end the British system, uh, at least the, the soldiers, um, had ramped up 
in in that six months, even though we were at a, tre- a truce. And don't forget, violence had never actually stopped in the north. So even in December, there's violence happening in um, in Belfast and, and in other cities in the north. So it's very difficult to know what more could have been done. I think um, certainly, you know, the women, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Mary McSweeney's speech. So she went on, we said, for three and a half, almost three hours. Um, very, very uh, sometimes personal. But, you know, she did talk about the death and the sacrifice and that there should be no compromise kind of possible, um, you know, in these with this treaty because why had their men I guess died you know um she witnessed her uh you know McSweeney starved to death um took him about 90 days to die so the women were able to kind of talk more about I think um the the suffering than maybe the men did um and you will see i I've, I've just gone back on it's the it's on the irish parliament's website it's called iraqthis.ie and the doll debates are there it's very difficult to kind of you know because they're so long you've got to go through all of them but basically um she she made no apologies for her speech which i thought you know she was kind of dead right to be able to say it um and as I say, you know, she had witnessed her brother. Now this, and the interesting thing too, for me about the women, almost all of them, all of them are anti-treaty. And of course, de Valera does absolutely nothing for them when he does eventually get into power. You know, it's, it's very strange. Like they are completely betrayed, I think, by, um, by de Valera. So um, she was, her speech was the longest one absolutely against compromise she said the stones would rise up if the compromise was passed um and her rejection we'll talk about it in january her rejection of the the vote in the chamber was contemptuous so she emerges from these debates as an extremist um although like Cahal Brua and Austin Stack, she would have accepted Eamon de Valera's document number two which in one way you know is like those, the differences in those documents are so slight as to be almost, almost unknowable. And at the same time, Collins points out that flaw that it maybe leaves Ireland more isolated, at least within within the Commonwealth. You know, you have Canada and Australia and New Zealand. Like if, if something is done to Ireland because it's on the same footing as those other territories or dominions, that they can argue like for group sort of support. Um, if you're externally associated, which you know was moot anyway because England was never going to agree to it, then what was where where was your status if you didn't have kind of that backup? So I don't know if anybody has any questions there on on YouTube or on Zoom. I know it's I've been talking for an hour, <laughs> and there's a there was a lot to dissect in in those slides. Um, we can kind of recap some of this. We will have, I think it's January 13th, I'm giving the January talk. So all you need to know right now is it has kind of descended into a battle of, or a contest of personalities almost, you know. Um, most people don't know what Document 2 entails. I think even those that do had read it realize there's not a whole pile of difference and realize if they had any kind of grasp on reality that Britain was not going to accept that they hadn't accepted it in July when de Valera first started talking about it they hadn't accepted it all throughout the summer when they renego- you know when they negotiated via letter they hadn't accepted it in October and November um you now have the north moving ahead their parliament has opened their you know full steam ahead they did gain concessions on the boundary commission and all of that and so I, some of them I think are more open to um the fact that maybe things can move ahead with ireland the big damage i think that is done here is really in some of the comments that they made about each other that they may not be able to take back and you know i wonder about the civil war how much of it is driven to be honest by um maybe ego or literally just dislike of other people as opposed to actual um principles because 
you know, they a lot of the people really do say things that they can't unsay, and that animosity between Brew and Stack on one side and and Collins on the other absolutely is exposed. Um, maybe the jealousy, you know, the fact that Collins had kind of secretly been running the IRB, which was secretly controlling the army, which the Minister for Defence was supposed to be running. Um, you know, there, there's all those kinds of issues. And there's no doubt, I think, that some people were principled that absolutely wanted a 32 county Ireland, you know, that nothing less than a republic should have been accepted. But I think, as some of the historians argue, I don't think a republic was ever on offer. And I think back as far, certainly as June, you know, when they talk about and remember like those remember those letters back and forth all throughout August and September, you know, come to discuss how best the aspirations of Ireland can, you know, be kind of compromised within within the association of the Commonwealth. It was always, always, always what was on offer was how we can best reconcile Irish nationalist aspirations within the Commonwealth. And De Valera, for all his efforts at trying to splice that out and trying to semantically like take things apart and and you know imply that there was more to a meaning the the british government were absolutely never going to compromise on ireland not being a member of the empire so i think if there's no questions everyone is um maybe <laughs> too inundated there's no questions on zoom and i can't see any comments on youtube i don't think either I'm afraid to look. Uh, no, but I don't think there are. So thank you everyone for tuning in. And as I say, we'll be back in January. Uh, we've just put up some of our events, I think, on our calendar. But this series will continue on, I think it's January 13th. And to be honest, next year, particularly for the first six months, we're going to swap to a every two month um, format because there is kind of a period of a lull between January and then when the Civil War itself kind of kicks off. So we'll do January, which is a little bit of this recap. Um, I probably want to talk more about some of the comments that are raised in the speeches. And then we'll go through the um, the fact that the country overwhelmingly over Christmas seems to kind of change the mind of some of the deputies. And so De Valera may have been right. I wonder had they voted on it before Christmas, you know, would those men who were kind of arguing their principles, would they have let their own opinion carry the day instead of when they go home hearing what their constituents have to say and possibly facing the reality. Don't forget like there's towns burnt out, you know, people are out of work, homes have been burnt. Uh, your district might look very different you know, when they've been slowly rebuilding their lives six months without these black and tans. And so I think the Christmas break was probably, uh, De Valera argues it was the women and their contribution, you know, this kind of hoydenish, um, shrewish behavior from the women, but it may have been that the will of the people actually changed their minds. So we'll, we'll talk about that in January. And we also have um, Makdara and, and Aaron Island, Shanaki and storyteller, singer. He'll be on Zoom with us. Uh, that's towards the end of January. And uh, God, I forget our other talk, <laughs> uh, but it'll come to me. It's on our Facebook page. So we're back in January for sure. Um, I will do one more post on Christmas Eve. I'm going to read a, a sort of a short Christmas story for you guys from uh, my neighbour, John B. Keen. But thank you all for tuning in and um, we'll be in touch. So take care, everyone. I'm going to end the meeting now because I don't see questions.